So I wanted to give a little talk today on Kadamba Kanan Swami's departure lecture, whatever that is. We're not sure when he's departing, but he has cancer, evidently. He won't be here for a long time. Now in his departure lecture, he mentions a number of times the demon Putana. Putana was a witch who uh, would kill children and drink their blood. And Kadamba mentions that his family may be connected to Putana because they like to drink the blood, probably of animals, I would assume. <laughs> but anyway, it is strange that he mentions Putana a number of times when a number of the victims of child abuse in ISKCON have said they were victims of a Putana society, a society that does not care for its children or worse, exploits and does damage to their children. Now, a number of children have told me they are the Varna Sankara. Varna Sankara means the unwanted progeny. They just said no one really cared about our situation. They were being exploited in their opinion and in the opinion of many people who look at the situation now. Now, in many cases, the parents were glad to have a place to drop off their kids, and some of the kids reported that they were just being dumped off, and the parents weren't really paying attention to the type of treatment and situation the kids were going to be in. And that is because the leaders were telling the parents, your main job is to collect money for us, <laughs> so we can have a nice opulent life for ourselves. The Swamis were living a very opulent life and the parents were collecting money to support the opulent life of those Swamis. So the parents weren't being told the main priority is your children. The main priority is taking care of us, the elite. So that's what happened. The focus was shifted over to the elite leaders of ISKCON and they were living high on the hog, they had big feasts, big cars, big houses, many servants, big feasts sometimes every day and the children were being in some cases fed rotten oatmeal and there was a substandard hmm, treatment for those children. So they felt we are the Varna Sankara, we are the unwanted progeny and I believe that's correct in many respects. Now, I also believe Kadamba is something like a child. He's a newer person, and he was misled. He was misled by the seniors, the same seniors that set up the system for themselves to live opulently at the expense of the children are the same seniors who trained him. And I just think he got the wrong training. So he's like a child himself, who got the wrong side of the story, so to speak. <laughs> that doesn't fully excuse him from supporting them and being part of their regime, on the other hand. You know, he, he is an adult, he has some responsibility. But anyway, what happened was the guru schools, the so-called guru schools, were being neglected. So they weren't spending money on food, clothing, soap, and necessary items for the children. That was going on. And meanwhile, the leaders were living nicely, so obviously there was a displacement of assets. And the teachers themselves uh, many times understood there was a problem, but because they were second tier, second echelon people, they didn't feel they had a big voice in the situation, so they couldn't really complain too much about it. But, I'll give you one example, there was a teacher named Linda Voith, and she told me that every kid in her Satsarupa school was molested, but no one reported it to the police. Her husband knew, Sanat, Steve Voith, he knew, but he didn't go to the police. And then later, the kids were committing suicide from this group, and so I helped them form a lawsuit, and Steve Voith was just vociferously against me. I mean, he just hated the idea that now, finally, 
the molesting was being exposed and people were going to be pulling their kids out of these schools. <laughs> he found that to be a big problem. So this was a problem we were dealing with, not only with this individual, but many, many individuals. We were trying to report the abuse and report the molesting, and we got just shafted, let's just say, at every step by all kinds of senior leaders and senior devotees and even the uh, second tier up and coming people didn't didn't really approve of what I was doing by exposing the molesting and starting a lawsuit to basically save the victims at the time who were committing suicide. We had to do something to stop the bleeding. So how did this all happen? I believe it happened by a manipulation by the upper class leaders. They de-emphasized the householder class and th thereby uh, de-emphasized the women and children and the welfare of women and children. Now to give you a few examples, Bhagavan kicked out a whole bunch of householders from the Paris Yatra and he just left them abandoned at the train station with no money, no diapers, no baby food, no nothing. He just left them there. A bunch of householders were left there with little tiny babies. So I, I went there and gave them some money. And most of them ended up going to Dry Tirtha's zone where they found some refuge, at least temporarily. <laughs> but I mean, Jai Tirtha was another problem as well. But the point I'm making is, Hari Kesh was kicking out householders, Ramachar was kicking out householders, Satsarup was kicking out householders. How to do to kick out every single householder? All of them were gone. So when they leave, the children are gone as well. So there's this whole idea, let's get rid of the families, let's get rid of the woman, let's get rid of the children. And let's have a fancy life for these swamis who are dressed in big orange robes, wearing expensive jewelry sometimes, driving in a nice car, let's take care of them, let's not take care of the woman and the children and the families. So it was a kind of anti-woman, anti-children, anti-family atmosphere created by these leaders. And so obviously the children in the school in that situation are going to end up getting a very bad short end of the stick, let's say. So they were unwanted, unwelcome, and not uh, not emphasized for all kinds of reasons. So one of these mothers, uh, her name is Kamala Kanti, and she was a quite attractive young lady, very photogenic, and her photo was used in different ISKCON publications to advertise ISKCON. But she had a baby. And she left Bhagavan's zone. She was in France. She came back to England and took her baby to her mother's house, claiming that Bhagavan was not providing the necessary things for her, her sanitary napkins, for example, and diapers and supplies for her baby. She said, you know, we're just not getting the supplies we need. So she went to England. The husband came up from France and got into a fight with the mother who had custody of the baby at the time and he kidnapped the baby back to France. So then Jayatirtha asked me to go back to France to get the baby, which I did. And so I brought the baby through the customs and everybody at the customs knew who the baby was. So this was a widely publicized story. This was in all the news media all over the place. Hare Krishna baby kidnapped and many people knew the story that the mother left uh, criticizing that there was not supplies for women and children and babies. So all kinds of devotees knew about the story. It's not like this was unknown. This was widely known all over the place. So it was known, I think, to a lot of people that the woman, the children, the school children, everybody in the, let's say, who was not a big swami, <laughs> was not getting very good treatment. People were getting kicked out with their babies, and so on and so forth. So there was, at the time, 11 zones, GBC guru zones, ISKCON zones, 
and householders were being kicked out of every single zone. So that should have raised a big red flag for anyone who remained there with a child. They are not taking care of your child. They're not taking care of the householders. The householders are being exiled out. They're unwanted. We don't want women, children, babies, etc. hanging around. We don't need that. So this was uh, already going on even when Prabhupada was here to some extent. Uh, Tamal had a big plan to move all the householders to some uh, deserted farm in the middle of the desert in Australia somewhere. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, no, we can't be doing that. But they had this tendency, these big Swami leaders, these 11 guys, who, who I mean became the 11 guys, they didn't have a good attitude towards householders. So it was almost a setup for children to suffer in that situation. Now, I believe a sufficient number of people knew about this, I would say hundreds, if not thousands. Therefore, they should have protested. They should have got some picket signs, maybe 20, 30 people, and protested in front of the temple. Hey, you know, we don't want to be part of a society which is removing our children. <laughs> we can't have that going on. You know, this is not what Prabhupada wanted. Prabhupada wanted these children. So he didn't want to exile the families with the children. That was definitely not his plan. But for some reason or other, people just never protested uh, no matter what happened. I mean, all kinds of horrible, eventually criminal things were going on left, right, and center all over Iskand. No one protested. No one went out with signs. No one went out in front of the temple and said, hey, we can't have all this crap going on, you know, in our society. So everyone kind of just abandoned the ship. And that really put the children in further peril. The, the children who were left were in a, a much worse condition because of a big mass exodus of, let's say, the good people, the better, uh, more qualified people, the people who had a little sympathy for family and children type uh, situations were being removed. And the fanatical, uh, you know, we're going to be renounced, we're going to give up you know, talking to women, associating with women, hanging around with children. We don't want any of that going on. That mood was increasing. The family mood was decreasing. I think everybody or almost everybody was aware or should have been aware of that situation. So then the next layer of trouble was that some of these swamis were actually homosexuals and pedophiles and or pedophiles, so they attracted a, a like-minded group around them. So they surrounded themselves with people who were predators in many cases. And especially in Mayapur, this was going on under Bhavananda, and I know a number of victims of Bhavananda's exploits, let's say. And then the Bengali boys that were under Bhavananda, under that Jayapataka Bhavananda regime, the uh, older Bengali boys were molesting the younger boys. So a whole system was being developed of, of rings, webs, and nests of, of pedophile uh, problems going on. Now what's interesting is that right at the very beginning in 1979, we knew that Jai Tirtha was having sex with a follower. And so I began to say, Prabhupada had said that when a guru has sex with a follower, that is the same as a father having sex with his own daughter. So I was saying, Jai Tirtha is a pedophile. And since he's the guru, everybody's worshiping the guru, then we're going to have a lot of pedophiles running amok in the society because you become what you worship. So if you worship a pedophile, you will have more pedophiles. You will attract pedophiles and you will create an atmosphere where pedophiles are tolerated and allowed. So I was warning about that early on. And of course I got severely, uh, let's say, boots in the face <laughs> from the leaders but also for many senior devotees. I mean, many, many senior devotees, like Ranchor, Prabhu Vishnu, these kind of guys, 
they, they weren't in any way uh, helpful to my cause. They thought I was a troublemaker and I was just making ridiculous claims that were uh, outlandish and unfounded and all that kind of thing. And that's been my history ever since. I mean, many devotees, hundreds of devotees, they said, well, Pran John, <coughs> you're like the uh, yellow journalist of uh, you know, the mundane world. You're like the National Enquirer. None of what you're saying is really true. You're just embellishing things. So I'm, I'm trying to say there's a big molesting problem, and they're just saying, well, no, there's no big problem. You're making it up. You're a liar, blah, blah, blah. So then I got kicked out of ISKCON, along with, you know, many other people, especially any, anyone who protested and who said, wait, you know, what's going on here? We can't have all this exploiting going on of this kind and of the citizens of this kind. So we got, you know, pushed back. So now our friend Kadamba is saying that the Guru Prampara, which starts from Krishna and goes to Lord Chaitanya and goes to Srila Prabhupada, also goes to his Prampara. Okay, well, wait a minute. How is that working? His prampara uh, has illicit sex with men, women, and children. It has sexual predators in it. It has drug addicts in it. It has drunks in it. How is that a prampara from God? How is that a chain of people from God? Every link in the chain has to be equal to, you know, the purity of God, or else they're not links in the chain. But he just says, you know, this is the prampara, it's all one thing, it comes from Krishna, and we're all part of that system. No, we are not. We are not part of that system. Uh, it is disconnected from Krishna, because Krishna's prampara contains no deviance, zero amount of deviance. So he's just making up things that he's heard. He's heard from the other elders. The other elders have said, yeah, sure, we have pedophiles, we have this, we have that, what's the problem? And then he gives a lecture about how we should be forgiving. Bhagavad Gita says we should forgive a neophyte who's falling down. Well, okay, but these people are not neophytes. They're claiming to be acharyas. They're claiming to be Krishna's pure successor representatives. Yes, a neophyte person can fall, probably will fall. We should expect that. We should be merciful when they do fall. That's all fine. But that has nothing to do with the Messiah of the religion. <laughs> the Messiah of the religion is not falling down and having all these problems. So he's blending together the levels of you know, pure devotees and neophyte devotees. We should be forgiving, but we never get forgiven, of course. We, the whistleblowers, the, the shit disturbers, you know, we, we don't get any relief. We don't get the mercy. We don't get the forgiveness. Uh, you know, Kadamba also talks about mercy. He goes on and on about mercy. We're all getting the mercy. Yeah, well, I got the mercy. I was banned. I was beaten. I was chased with bats. My friends were killed. I would have been killed without help from the FBI. The FBI was tapping the phones of the hit people who were coming to get me. That's the only reason I'm alive. How is that mercy? How is banning, beating, molesting, suing, killing, how is that mercy to other people? It's, it's not mercy. It's very vicious, very violent oppression. We are, we are not distributing mercy when we are treating people in this way. But he confuses the issue. Well, everybody's getting the mercy. No, everybody's not getting <laughs> I'm being chased with baseball bats. I'm not getting the mercy here. Hello? That's not mercy. But this is, you know, this is what he hears from the other senior elders. Well, we're giving the mercy. No, you are not giving the mercy. You're giving trouble. And you are giving molesting when it comes to many, many children. That is not mercy. Now, one of the explanations that they have given the victims is, you're getting your karma. You are getting your karma. Oh, well, that takes me off the hook. I'm just, you know, I'm a criminal. I'm robbing the bank. The bank just has the karma to be robbed. What's the problem? Well, the problem is you are not authorized to give bad karma to the bank. But notice what happens. This gives the victims another a kick in the head, really. 
you were you were let's say you were raped and you were uh, you had your purse stolen and you go to the police and they just tell you well it's karma what's the problem you deserved to be mistreated no other people do not deserve to be mistreated nor do you deserve to mistreat them that is not your uh, capacity but he just he merges all these different things together because that's what he's heard he's heard that the leaders have twisted everything around yeah we've got to be merciful merciful to us no merciful to who oh merciful to the perps merciful to the criminals the whistleblowers are they going to get any mercy no now some people have said i've been a little too crazy emphasizing that the neophytes cannot absorb the sins of others. I do believe that Jai Veda Swami said, I can't take any more karma, and he deputed Kadamba to be his agent who would be taking karma. Kadamba's been taking karma, now he has cancer. I don't see why we shouldn't emphasize this point. It seems to me like a very fatal mistake if you misunderstand this point. If you start taking karma from other people, there can be very dire consequences, including you could die. So really the next problem was that as soon as we began to protest, for example, Jai Tirtha and saying Jai Tirtha is really a pedophile, then B.R. Sridhar Maharaj of the Gaudiya Math began to attack us. He said, none should protest. You need a living guru. Jai Chirth is a living guru. What's the problem? Well, he's a living pedophile. <laughs> a living guru. Uh, you know, so they always mix things up. You know, they mix up a pedophile with a guru. They mix, mix up Krishna, who is God. Okay, God is a pure being. Therefore, the successor to God, the representative of God, has to also be pure. They don't like that. They find some deviated person and make him the successor. You know, and Sridhar did that in 1936. He paid a bisexual deviant into the guru of the Gaudiya Math, and there was all kinds of problems, including that dissenters were beaten up and killed. And then the guru committed suicide later by taking poison. So, you know, this is not a very good standard for us to follow. We shouldn't be following these deviated programs. They don't end well. It didn't end well in 1936. It didn't end well now. But then we have, you know, guys like Tripurari and many others who support Sridhar still. They still think Sridhar was right to support the 11 gurus and help them write all kinds of crazy position papers and documents which were just very offensive and, and very misleading. And then later, uh, this guy went to Narayan Maharaj and Narayan Maharaj was a good friend of Tamal. And he was also supporting the 11 elite sannyasi, you know, group type people. And this was a, another problem. It's kind of interesting that when I was helping the Texas lawsuit against the mall, Narayan Marge was also in Texas at the same exact time. And he was opposing me. He called me the Ritvik poison. So I'm poison because I'm saying we can't have our children molested. <laughs> That's a very poisonous idea. And he's supporting Tamal. And Tamal used to actually say, my two favorite people in the world are Narayan Maharaj and Srila Bhavananda Maharaj. <laughs> and Bhavananda was a ringleader of the uh, pedophile situation, I, I, I would say, in my part. I mean, he was part of the group of people that were mistreating the children. So uh, later on, uh, it's interesting, Narayan Maharaj invited me to talk to him about all this stuff. I go to his ashram. I'm sitting there at 8.30. He cancels the meeting. 11 o'clock, cancels the meeting. 2 o'clock, cancels the meeting. 5 o'clock, cancels the meeting. He le he's gone. He's left the property without notifying me. So he invites me over to discuss these things. He can't discuss it with me because... You know, I'm going to ask the hard questions. Why are you supporting all this stuff? Then he goes and hangs out with Kirtananda, who is one of the pedophiles. And he gives him a big hug, and he has hours and hours to spend monkeying around with Kirtananda. 
So he has plenty of time to spend speaking to the pedophile gurus and no time to talk to us. Then a lot of the parents of Iskand sent their kids to Narayan. You know. So first of all, the parents went along with the, the 11 process to a large extent or enough of an extent to cause a lot of trouble for many children. Then after all that, they send their kids to the supporters of the GBC regime. Let's go to the supporters like Sridhar Maharaj, Narayan Maharaj, or BP Puri, or other people like that, or the Babaji's who were friendly to the GBC. So this kind of contained me. I, I, I'm trying to protest and I'm just surrounded on all sides. I got the leaders against me. I got many of the rank and file against me. I've got these big Swami leaders from India against me. So I'm in real bad shape here. So I had to take shelter of the police and the media and the courts. And that was it. And they saved my life, really, working with those people. So I had to go outside, outside authority, because the internal structure was just, was gone. It was just completely eaten up. There was nothing left. So it kind of reminds me of these caterpillars that get bitten by a wasp, and then the eggs of the wasp eat up the cater caterpillar, <laughs> and he's gone. So you know, his kind became like that. It was just eaten up by these guys. They just ate up the body of the caterpillar and consumed the whole thing. And so there was no checks and balances left. There was no structure left. There was no society left. It was just, you know, get away with whatever you can get away with. If you can embezzle funds, go ahead. If you can have sex with a follower, go ahead, and so on and so forth. And that is why the book, Monkey on a Stick, compared the GBC to a gutless wonder, a gutless wonder. And clearly, many of these leaders became like megalomaniac, narcissistic psychopaths, <laughs> to put it mildly. You know, they were just out of control. And they had the help of these other swamis, like Sridhar and Narayan and others who were encouraging them. Yeah. You're fine, you're gurus, go ahead. And uh, then all this molesting and beating and murders and so many other crimes started to manifest. Because you need to have some checks and balances system. You can't just have people who think they're as good as God and, you know, they can just get away with whatever they can get away with. That, turns everything into a criminal enterprise, and that is very dangerous for children. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention one other point. Kadamba mentions poison a number of times, Puchana and poison, and I do believe that the founder of ISKCON, the Acharya of ISKCON, Srila Prabhupada, was intentionally given poison by a cabal of leaders. Okay, the same leaders who later became the gurus and swamis and sannyasis and the creators of the child molesting regime. So I believe the Prabhupada was poisoned. His followers were kicked out and the children were poisoned indirectly by being mistreated. You can also poison a person by indirect means, by discouraging them, by attacking them and, you know, exploiting them. That's a, that's a form of poisoning a, a person. It causes severe consequences for that person. So I believe all of this is connected. Prabhupada was the original victim. He was poisoned, I believe. And there's much evidence of that. Two brand new books have come out on that. It's a two volume set with considerable amounts of evidence and testimony and explanations and scientific research and all the rest of it. So I think it's pretty conclusive that Prabhupada did say, I am being poisoned 
everybody in the room agrees he says he's being poisoned and I think they, they wanted to get rid of him. He, sa he said, no more sannyas. I'm going to suspend the sannyas order. And these guys were the big sannyasis. They were the big leaders, the big renunciates. They didn't want to have the carpet pulled out from under them. Prabhupada said, no more sannyas. We're going to make Ranashrama with householders. That means, you know, grihasta householders will be in charge of everything. They did not like that. And so I believe they decided to take him out, and they did. And then they attacked us, the followers, and then they attacked the children. Just wave after wave of attacks. And I don't believe that Kadamba really understands all of this. Or maybe he doesn't want to understand all of this. <laughs> There's a lot of denial going on in ISKCON. One friend of mine tried to commit suicide and he recovered. He was sent to the hospital, but when he recovered, he said, the biggest problem in ISKCON is denial. Everybody is in denial. So I think a lot of people do know about a lot of problems, including banning, beating, molesting, murders, and who knows what. But they're afraid. They're afraid of the regime. They're afraid to speak out. Anyway, the next step is, I think we should review a little section of Kadamba's lecture and I'm going to give a little short audio clip here just so people can get a flavor for the way he was making his presentation which quite honestly was a little mind-bogglingly strange to me but that's the problem. I see all kinds of strange things going on and no one else does or <laughs> not enough people do. So, anyway, here it is. Here is what Kadamba had to say. But I want to take advantage. I'm, I'm not going to let them hijack the Bhagatam class, you know, for, for Kadamba Kalana Swami, who is somehow or other <clears throat> uh, received mercy, a lot of mercy, but who is otherwise from a Putana stock, you know, I mean, like, you know, somewhere in our family lineage, my great-great-grandmother was none other than Putana herself. <laughs> and some of the remnants of her inclinations remained in the family. And even today, you know, some of my family members have fangs and all kinds of... Uh, such things uh, you know and I will not speak about what they like to drink but it's very similar to Putina who liked the blood of babies <laughs> so tasty yeah so um, therefore um, due to that Putana effect in my in my uh, family lineage, in my genes, in my uh, deeply ingrained. Um, I've also mixed some poison in my devotional service uh, here uh, consistently. I never failed. Right. Mm. and have been good in hiding it also so um, but the truth of the matter is is um, at the end of our life looking back at, um, at, at many years in devotional service um, um, we can appreciate that it's just all about mercy. Um, sometimes I say, I, I haven't changed a bit. I'm still the same one. I always was, you know. So I come from a long line of Putinas, and Putinas drink the blood of children, and I am that same person, and many people 
tell me that ISKCON has become a satanic child sacrificing cult who would be in the line of Putina. So we've got child sacrificing, we've got poison, we've got a guru who was poisoned and I believe Prabhupada was poisoned and then the poison spread to the leaves and the branches and the fruits where it has remained. And until all this is cleared up, ISKCON will suffer and so will the citizens of ISKCON. Haribo, all glories to Srila Prabhupada.